Hi, welcome to Tim Talk. I'm Tim Hunt and I'm the Director for Personal Counseling here at Sand Hills Community College. And this is part two of our discussion on suicide and transactional analysis. So let's jump right in. So, in the last Tim Talk, I discussed ego states, right? This is what we call a script matrix. So we are looking at the ego states of my mother, the ego states of me, and the ego states of my father. And I draw this this way so that we can display what's called driver behavior and injunctions. And let me tell you a little bit about what driver behavior is. So driver behavior is the way that I learned as a child to be okay with the big people in my life, or to be okay with my parents, or whoever was in that parental um, place. And the way that I could be okay with them is if I behaved in a certain way. And the reason why we call it driver behavior is because this is what drives our behavior. And there are five, five driver behaviors. Be strong, be perfect, hurry up, try hard, others. So communicated from my dad, dad's parent ego state to my parent ego state, in my family of origin, it was uh, my dad wanted me to be strong. Boys don't cry. Boys don't cry. Boys don't have feelings. What are you doing crying? Stop that crying. Quit acting like a little girl. We don't do that. Hunts don't cry. My father was very stoic. And then, from my mother's parent ego state to my parent ego state, she communicated to me, I want you to be perfect, and I want you to please me. So it says, please others or please me. So, as a little boy, my mother would take me to get my hair cuts, and my hair was cut just like JFK's little boy. And she would dress me up in all these really sweet little clothes and I looked like somebody off the cover of a magazine um, because mama wanted us to be me perfect and she also wanted me to please her in everything that I did and so growing up that's exactly what happened that was the driver behavior and so as we get inundated with that driver behavior through childhood remember we said childhood in TA is from five years of age until 12 years of age I grew up and that's still the way that I can behave lots of times in my day-to-day -day work until I went into therapy. And when I went into therapy, I began to address my own driver behavior issues. I learned there's power in permissions. So I had to start giving myself the permission that it's okay to be weak. I also had, which is the antithesis for be strong. And I had to give myself the permission that it's okay for me to please myself rather than pleasing others in my life. As well as, it's okay to make mistakes. If I don't draw the egg perfectly, it's fine. Even though I erased it and I drew a pen. <clears throat> but, for this Tim talk, now we're gonna look at injunctions. So, just like driver behavior, injunctions are spoken from our parents, child ego state and communicated to our child ego state when they're under stress. There are 12 injunction messages that are given during this time frame. And here they are. Don't. So these are don't messages. Don't be. Don't exist. Don't be close. Don't be important. Don't be a child. Don't grow. Don't succeed. Don't be you. Don't be sane, don't be well, don't belong, don't fear. Now, I was raised, I'm Native American, and I was raised in a family with three older brothers. No, I'm sorry, two older brothers and a baby brother. I am the middle child. And in that family, um, I was very fair-skinned, fair-skinned Lundy Indian. And I thought for the longest time that I was Caucasian. And so my older brothers were a lot darker than me and they would tell me all the time growing up, you were adopted. 
you were adopted, you're not from this family. And I began to believe that because I heard that message a lot. And also, I didn't feel like I fit in because I was sensitive. And the other boys, they didn't cry, but I did. And so I felt like I had this injunction of don't belong, don't be close. And it was constantly being reiterated. Now, my parents never said that. My parents never said to me, you're not our child. They did everything possible to make me feel like I was part of the family. But brothers, being brothers, they communicate that. And you know, as children, we can believe those kind of things, whether it's said or not said. And so there was this one day we were in Lowe's leaving, and a friend of my mother's walked up and she said, Charlene, where'd you get that white young, white young from? They called me the milkman's child. Where'd you get that milkman's child? And when I heard that, I was like, see there, I know it. I don't belong. And from there, I would go and I would look in mama's drawers when she was out of her bedroom to see if I had adoption papers. Now, let's fast forward to my 40s when I started doing therapy with folks. I knew that I had to address that this issue of me not being close because that was one of the things that I learned in life was to keep people not to trust and to keep people at bay. Well, that doesn't make for healthy relationships. So I had to start giving myself the permission that it's okay to belong and I'm actually a part of this family and it's okay to be close. So the key in this talk is about permissions. Now, somebody's asking the question right now, Tim, I thought this talk was going to be about suicide. What does permissions have to do with suicide? Permissions have everything to do with suicide. Because as friends, as brothers, as sisters, as close folks to people that struggle with that, people that struggle with suicide need the permission to live. And they need to hear that. And when I have someone come into my office and they're struggling with suicidal ideation or suicidal tendencies, I am constantly giving them permission. I need you to live. If you kill yourself, it's going to affect me in the following ways. If you kill yourself, it's going to affect Samuel in the following ways. And we walk that out. We talk about how it's going to affect people, but I'm constantly giving the permission that I need them to live. Here's the other thing that happens with folks that feel suicidal. They have this. They've got the injunction, don't exist. And the way injunctions work, as long as I am, let's say, we'll use the driver behavior being perfect. As long as I'm perfect, I can exist. But the minute I start making mistakes, that's when I have to fall back into my injunction message, which is to kill myself. How does that look? So I'm making straight A's, I'm doing well in school, I'm working my program, I'm in recovery. But the minute I relapse, the minute I step out of line, and the minute my world begins to fall apart, I begin to feel like there's no point in me being here. I need to check out. I need to leave. Now, in transactional analysis, we call those escape hatches. So you see this beautiful egg that I had to redraw because I've got those perfection tendencies. I wanted to make sure it was perfect for camera. But this egg represents who we are. It represents us. It represents me as an individual. And when you think about an egg, the best part of an egg is the yolk. It's what's on the inside. Now, in transactional analysis, we believe that people under stress will create what we call negative, creative solutions on how to exit life. We can run away. We can cut ourselves, we can go crazy, or we can kill ourselves, or get someone to kill me. And remember, this is a negative creative strategy to get away from the stress. 
in some form or fashion. And so transactional analysis is about <clears throat> helping the person close these escape hatches from the childhood history. Because when an individual is feeling like they want to use one of these escape hatches, it's usually from the child ego state. Because if you remember from the previous talk, that's where all of our feelings exist. So when I'm feeling sad, when I'm feeling hopeless, when I'm feeling like I don't have worth and value and I'm ready to get out of here, it's in that child ego state where we're giving the message, I want you to live. And I want you to live well because of the following reasons. And when we do that, here's where the permission hits. It's okay for you to exist. You don't have to be perfect. You can exist and make mistakes. And that requires deep change on the inside. And when that change happens on the inside, a person can begin to feel healthy and they can live a balanced life because we're teaching them in therapy to be responsible, to make good decisions, to live, and to take good care of themselves. And that's what you want. Thank you for this good talk.